No sweat. It's funny. I literally, I got down here a few minutes early and I was getting a coffee down the street and I get a text from Justin Jay. No way. Yeah. He's like, do you ever hook up with David? I'm like, I am literally like about to walk into the interview with him. That's so funny. I'm going to be in New York next week. Oh, sick. So I'm going to try to connect. Yeah, yeah. I think he's, I forget what the dates were, but he said he's coming out here in August. Okay, cool. Then maybe we'll see each other two times this year. Yeah. Um, To officially start, I'm going to ask you a bit of trivia. Hit me. What surf film was no use for a name's song Soulmate used in? Oh, my God. That's a good question. Um, or did you even know that it was used in a surf Well, film? I knew it was, I mean, no use of music, you know, that era of surf, you know, the whole like momentum generation era, like was so, th- those surf movies were so powerful for that scene. You know, that it helped that scene a lot. I, that, that was the record that I joined on. Like, no, I didn't play on it, but I joined like when in the middle of, touring of them it, touring it. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember. I just remember back in those days, you'd always get like, like, you, you didn't even get, like, paid for it, and you didn't care because it totally helped your draw. I mean, that's what put a lot of those bands, helped put them on the map, you know? It's funny. We're, I'm glad to hear that because in my awareness, yeah. the punk scene was way bigger than the surf scene, so I just presumed that, like, uh, we were the surf scene was grateful to even be able to use that music. So I'm glad to hear that it actually fueled the success of the oh, scene. Oh, yeah. Too. No, t- I mean, I think it was, it, it, you know... Synergy. scratch each other's backs yeah, on, yeah, on yeah. that one big time you know but like yeah that that whole era like i remember doing tours where you'd be on the east coast and we we never really drew that well on the east coast you know that yeah. that scene kind of had different it, at different points through the 90s was stronger in certain places oh okay you know like it would die, be dying off in one area and get stronger somewhere else but like the east coast was never great like you would play, I remember one time we played like New York and there was like a hundred people and Boston was like 70 people. Then you'd go to Florida and it'd be packed. Okay. You know what I mean? Because surf land down there, you know totally. what I mean? So totally. anywhere where there was like a strong surfing scene, skateboarding scene, snowboarding scene, you know? Yeah. Would, would, dev- would be stronger. I'm wondering if it's kind of like that now in a sense or like the free use thing. There, you didn't expect to get paid. They were using it in the film because you knew it was a back scratch. Yeah. Um, not to reveal too much, but on in the podcast scene, it's kind of that way right now. Like right. occasionally I'll get a slap or a notice from Spotify being like, this is the Beatles or whatever. It, right. I don't really use the Beatles, but if I've ever used a song that was yeah. big enough, yeah. then I'll get a notification from Spotify. But by and large, yeah. it kind of just everything is used. It, you know? I only ever get dinged for my podcast on YouTube. They yes. seem to take all my shit down. For sure. Because I'll because you know, I'm like using, a, if I interview some artist that has a new record, I'll use a little snippet of their exactly. song, like not the whole song, but just a little bit of it. And that always seems to get flagged. So YouTube's yeah. way more aggressive or savvy about that. Right. But the, but the fair use concept, when I look back at that, it was worth, like it was yeah. a back scratch of a back. Oh, big time. So for everybody involved, it was worth sharing. It's an interesting thing because I think it swung completely the other way, you know, in the, in the years after that, where everybody got hip, and there was a lot of money in getting sinks. I don't think there's as much money in getting sinks now, but so I think, that's and plus like young musicians now, you know, like pro surfers or any, you know, any kind of celebrity, they kind of have to be their own entrepreneurial, you know, brand. They're all, every totally. time I talk to like a 22 year old music, they're so much smarter and more like hip to, you know, how the business side of everything works that I think, I mean, I don't know how what people's attitudes are about it now. I would still be like, yeah, dude, use my shit in anything. <laughs> you know, I don't care. Um, but, like, I think it got there as, like, the, the, the old-fashioned mainstream routes to getting exposure died off. You know, getting sinks was a big one. Right. And then I think the, maybe the bottom kind of has dropped out of that, too. So, I don't know. Maybe it's come full circle. Uh, I appreciate people who are entrepreneurial, you know, but I also – my. I like, I don't know that I want to have a bunch of, I want to have a beer with them. I'd rather a beer with a guy who's more free, free spirited and sharing because ultimately, um, whether it's surfing or music, it's like, you just want reps under your belt. You just want the experience. You just want the, and if your quality, if the work, work is good quality, you'll succeed at it. And eventually the payday will come, you know? Yeah. So yeah, maybe. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not. More often yeah. than not. I mean, not. I, I don't know. It's a weird thing because, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of of the mindset that, like, I don't know. Some people are cut out to with, have that 
that type of brain, you know, some people can, can balance both, you know, yeah, like yeah. I'd be like a super creative artist and, and also be like totally up on the latest techie shit. Like I'm not one of those people, <laughs> but, no. um, but, uh, and I think there's probably a lot of great artists that, that would, pro that probably, you know, uh, or even great surfers that probably fall under the radar because they're not like super adept at that, that sort of the, how you have to, you know, Van Gogh never sold a painting in right. his life. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. could be so pro like amazing in your work yeah. and never see a dime to yeah. it, which is a shame. Yeah. Uh, well, for the record, I don't even know what uh, surf film that was <laughs> that that song was in. But when I was going back in preparation for today, listening to some of that music, because I'm like, man, no use for a name. I used to listen to them all the time. I had albums. Yeah. Let me revisit that music. And I came across Soulmate and I could see Timmy Curran blowing the tail out. And I was like, in my head, but I'm like, what was the film? And I've got it narrowed down. It was either a Josh Palmer film. He did a series called The Kill right. in that time. And then there was another dude in that area, Oxnard kind of area, yeah. um, named Marshall Kozai. So I think it's either a Marshall Kozai mm. film, which I know these names are falling on deaf ears across <laughs> our listenership, but I think it was a Timmy Curran section. We should text Timmy. I was going to say, you him. know Timmy. Oh, I know him. Yeah. Okay, sure. perfect. Yeah, yeah. We'll I out. will find out. We'll, you can put that in your links after the fact. Perfect. Yeah. There was also um, a me first in the Gimme Gimme's Rocket Man, I think was used in uh, a Jason Rapoy Collins section. Oh, really? I think so. Nice. Yeah. Nice, because yeah, I remember man. when it, whenever you go in, like it, during those years when I was in No Use for a Name, um, and when the Gimmies first started, I, I lived in San Francisco, and that's where Fat Records was or is still, um, which Fat Mike from No Effects that that's his label, that's right, right, that's so, right. Um, yeah, and you would go. I I don't even remember having discussions about like can they use your <laughs> music, and if, I, like, I think that that was just a given. You know, we always wanted it. Yeah. Um, and when you go in there, you get like, you know, they'd always have a stack of whatever the latest surfing or snowboarding flick that had some of their music in, you know? Yeah. And that was good enough. Yeah, totally. Um, so how old were you at that time and what was your awareness to, did you, had you started surfing then? Or? I didn't really start surfing. No, it's funny, man. I have a funny surf, like my surf, um, like the way, went, the way I started surfing, I grew up in Santa Barbara and was a total beach kid, but I never surfed. And it's like borderline embarrassing to admit that I was like a boogie boarder as a kid and even through high school even like you know had like the whatever that the Mori boogie with the slick bottom and you put the fins Mach, in it yes Mach seven yes yeah totally <laughs> well there's a bunch yeah. of mocks but yeah. the seven was yeah yeah one. that I did whatever it was bright yellow I remember that you know so I spent a lot of time at the beach and it's funny because in listening to your podcast especially like the grit like I told every time you guys start talking about a vulnerable adult <laughs> learner I'm always like I'm I'm fucking that guy I'm totally like I'll never not be that guy yeah because um, I didn't really start surfing until I was in my 20s you know okay. and it was actually when I was in no use because I lived up north and the drummer for no use Rory surfs and so he took me over to Santa Cruz once and um, the first surfboard I ever actually bought was uh, at a, some shop in San Francisco. Surfed it a couple times. It was just so cold. Such a different animal up there. It's yeah. just so unforgiving. that I was like, fuck this. So I left it at my brother's house in L.A. And every time I'd come through L.A., I'd go grab it. And Does he still have it? Around. I still have it. It's, it's in my house. That's literally one of my questions was, what was the first board you ever owned? I don't know what the brand is. It's like not a well-known shape or anything, but it's like a 9-0, like... I guess you would think of it almost like a high performance longboard. Okay. You know, I didn't know what the fuck it was at the time. I was of course. just, I grew up watching Big Wednesday and loved that movie and was yeah, obsessed yeah. with that. So I just went, I was like, if I'm going to try surfing, I'm, I'm going to try it on a longboard. You know what's but, funny? The, um, you being embarrassed about being a bodyboarder mm. all that time, I've learned that's a very Californian thing right. to be embarrassed. Oh, right. Beca yeah, because that's how I was came up to. And I was absolutely, as soon as I got rid of that thing, I never mentioned it again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> totally. like I wanted yeah. to be known as a surfer, yeah. but it's like having winger records in your record collection. There you you go. don't talk about it much. There you, you go. Know? But I talk, you know, you go to Hawaii, bodyboarding is absolutely as respected as surfing is. Really? Australia, yeah. Really? Yeah. And then well, I for realized. For our international listeners, let me claim my the, Moray Boogie. There you go. Yeah. Because I realized I was shaming them publicly all the time, bodyboarders, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I just figured everybody was raised yeah. like you and I were. Not the case. You get a black eye the last time exactly. you were in Oahu. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, like there was this golden period. So like, like through that time, like sort of when I was in no use and, and when I, in the early period there, when I first joined Foo Fighters, like I, I was just 
trying, like I would surf here and there when I was somewhere that was warm or, you know, if we were in Hawaii or sure. if we were in Australia, I'd just go give it a go. But there was this period there when I got, um, I was living in New York after I lived in San Francisco and I wound up moving back to California and it was right in this little window. It was before I made the first record that I made with Foo Fighters. So it was this window we had finished touring for the last record and we had this little window there and I was back in LA and like I had lived in LA years ago, but all my friends had like gotten married and had kids and scattered and they were out in the burbs. And so it was this weird little period where I had nothing going on for like, I don't know how long it must've been like six months or something. And I would just wake up every day and drive to El Porto and go surf down there. And like not realizing that it was like the worst place to try to learn how to ride a longboard, just get pounded totally. in, in like shore break, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was great. It was like, was like, that was the period that I really like kind of got a little more obsessive about it and did it more regularly. So much of it, uh, is that ritual of getting up early in the morning, yeah. going and getting in the cold water, Yeah, you know, like yeah. the getting up and actually riding down the line thing. That's fine too. But that's, that's so far off. Like the ritual and the experience of what you're talking about mm. to me is what I mm -hmm. identify with as like. Oh yeah. Surfing. Yeah. You know? There's nothing better than that. Like when it's like cold and a totally. little damp outside and it's winter time and you see every fiber crusty. of your soul is like, what are you doing? Totally. <laughs> and you're getting into a damp wetsuit but you and then, paddling out. And then, but that feeling when you're in the water and like, you know, sun's coming up over the hill, that's just like, that's, that's like for me as close as you get to like any kind of like spiritual, totally religious experience. You know? Completely agree. That's what also, um, has given me a lot of my discipline. It's what's given me a lot of my work ethic in sure. life, I think, was going yeah. through all of that, you yeah. know? Um, and now I'm all soft. Now I avoid it. Like, <laughs> now yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm not getting out of bed until yeah. eight and the water better be warm and yeah. be the waves better be good. Oh, I know. You could right. probably count the days on one hand per year that I actually get out and Dawn Patrol now. But, it's brutal. You know, well, yeah. right now the waves are actually really good earlier yeah. in this week. And yeah. Matt, the shaper from Album, when I walked in, he's like, dude, how good was it this week? And I just hang, had hung my head in shame. Like, uh, sadly, it was a low priority for me. Well, this you just my, had a kid, right? Thank you. Yes, yeah. I did. So yeah, yeah. that's my priority. See, I'm on the other side. Of that. I have three boys, and they're teenage. My, my oldest is, is going off to college soon. Okay. So, and then I got two other kids in high school. And so you'll have that period where you're, you know, where, yeah, you're in like AY, so soccer games every weekend and birthday parties and play dates and school and blah, 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 blah. And that's going to eat up a lot of your time and you're not going to be surfing much. But then there's this glorious moment where your kids get like waterproof on the other side of that, where then now you can go surf Zuma and third point and Rincon with them and not worry that they're going to get killed. Right. And like, that's when it opens up again. Cause okay. I had the exact same thing. Like okay. we had kids I really didn't surf a whole lot through. They would be like big, you know, it is too, especially with traveling a lot with like with touring. Yeah. You go, if I'm in the middle of a tour cycle and I'm home for two weeks and then gone again and in that two week window, there's, there's no swell. It can all of a sudden be like three months before, and I haven't been in the water and then you're just fucking out of it. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And then it's, then that can become six months really easy. It's just, I, it's like that thing. It's like a marriage. You have to totally work at it, well, you know? I don't feel, I said I hung my head in shame. I actually felt no shame at all. I am thrilled to be able to stay home with the kid right now. And the mornings are so much fun and I don't mind missing surfing. Sure. But what I notice is um, my body is atrophying <laughs> <laughs> and my mind to a certain degree, yeah. you know, like yeah. I'm just, I feel my workload throughout the day feels like a slog if I don't do things for myself. Yeah. And I'm probably not as good as a father if I'm not doing things for myself. Right. So in the day to day, I prioritize spending time with him or even recording podcasts or whatever it is. But by the end of the day, I'm like, dude, I shouldn't have prioritized things that way. I need to start checking that surf box. You'll never get the balance right either. That's really? the dirty little secret of parenting. You never figure it out and you never stop second guessing. And you sit there and when your kids get a little older, you're going to go, oh my God, I fucked up this and that and I should have done this. And I, but all right. at the end of the day, it, it all works out. All I mean, right. I'll it really stop feeling guilty about it. You know? um, I was actually, it's funny that you brought up the touring thing because I was going to ask you how you manage or how you have managed over the years spending that much time away from the kids. 
at some point, can you bring them? I mean, how do we you bring reconcile? them a lot? Yeah. Okay. Like just during the summertime, you know, it's easy when your kids are really small, you know, before school sets in and before they've really learned how to like say no and stuff, you know, that's a, those are actually, you think when your kid's a baby, that's going to be the hardest time to travel. It's actually the easiest time really? to travel. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, I mean, the, you, they go through that toddler stage where you're like, you're on a plane and they're like, it's like having a drunk rat guy <laughs> running around the plane, you know, that you can't control. So that can be, that can certainly be challenging. But no, um, it's, it's, it's hard to be away from your kids as much as I have been away from my kids over the years. But it's also the only life my kids have ever known. It's the only version of parenting I've ever known. It was baked into the cake before we had kids. We... I mean, I'd say we knew what we were getting into, but you don't really fucking know what you're getting into. How could you? When, you know what I mean? So, no, it's it's really hard, man. I've, I've missed a lot of birthdays. i missed a lot of holidays. i missed a lot of stuff. But I also, the flip side of that is like, when I'm home, I'm home. Yeah. I'm yeah. home for a long stretch, and you're in it. So as much as I missed, I, I'd i like to think I made up for on the other side. Well, and the time that they are, that they are able to travel with you. Yeah is a gift that no kids ever get. You totally. Know? You know what's really great is that my oldest now, you know, he just graduated high school because our kids have been, I, I don't know about you, I didn't go anywhere when I was a kid. Like, my family didn't travel. We didn't have any money, you know what I mean? So, like, I was, that was a huge part of the allure of wanting to be in a band and go on the road. I just wanted to see the world, you know? I, when I first started touring, I'd just be stoked to go to fucking Fresno or something. I'd be like, no way, Fresno's fucking rad, I can't believe, you know? Like, I didn't care, I just wanted to get out and, and see what, anywhere. So to have been able to provide that for my kids that they've been, you know, all, literally all over the world, like, you know, and all over Europe, like a bunch of times, and, and seeing that, I it makes me really happy, but I also I get to see that now with, you know, my oldest is an adult, and he just went, and traveled or he kind of went and stayed in youth hostels and stuff with some buddies right after he graduated okay. and did it like not on a Foo Fighter tour, not staying in a nice hotel, not flying around on a private jet, not with somebody taking care of every detail. You know what I mean? Right. And it was, and he fucking killed it and he okay, had the best okay. time ever. And it's okay. so great to see that. You're like, wow. Okay. So you did get a lot out of all, all right. those years, you know, that well, was a that, good investment. The fact that he appreciates it. Yeah. yeah. You know, cause the, the other flip side of that is they just grow up jaded. Right. And they're just like, oh, yeah. I don't need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. Good for you. Yeah, and good parenting. Well, you know, thanks. I mean, it's <laughs> it's you because you don't know. I mean, it's like it's like your your kid's perspective. It just is what it is. Like they've grown up in a very different environment than I grew up in, a very different environment than my wife grew up in. And you want them to be grounded and you want them to be, you know, to appreciate all the all the perks and all the good stuff. But it's like, how do you how do you really know? I have no idea, dude. You know? That's the problem is I'm going to freaking shower this kid with way more than he <laughs> needs. Know. You know, like totally. I'm trying to provide every resource, yeah. every detail, protect him. And then I'm just realizing like, no, that's he needs to struggle a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know. It's crazy. Um, so we covered what was the first surfboard you owned. Uh, what was the first album that you purchased? Oh, I know that one exactly. It was Kiss Double Platinum. Wow, yeah. great album. Yeah, that was the first album that I went and bought with my own money. Right, right, right. Which was a funny thing to buy because we had all the Kiss albums anyway. See, that's the thing is my, I had two older brothers. I have two older brothers, and they were already totally music obsessed okay. you know, by the time I ever came around. So for a really long time, I actually probably bought that record maybe in like sixth grade or something. You know, I was like probably pretty old for buying your first record. Um because I just didn't need to buy records. My brothers had all the Elvis, all the Beatles, all the Stones, all the Zap, all the Sabbath, all the Deep Purple, you know, all the ACDC, the Judas, whatever, you know, they just had all those records. And so I didn't really need to buy anything. And then when it was, um, when I, I don't even remember what prompted me to do it. I just, I think I just, the, the act of like, I want to buy my own fucking record. That's how know? I felt too. Um, sure. And then I just bought something that we already had. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, were your parents musically inclined? Not at all. Okay. My dad was was a big music lover. Yeah, yeah. And I think he's the one that really kind of instilled that in my oldest brother, Mike. You know, kind of got him going down that road okay. first. And then Scott, my, my middle brother, came along. And, and same. And then I was just kind of born into it. So, um, and my mom was, I wouldn't even, I don't even know how much my mom likes music. <laughs> like, I mean, she had records when we were kids. And I say that with love, Mom, if you're listening. Um, but, like, she, like... She would listen to like Anne Murray and Fleetwood Mac and stuff like that, but not. I don't really remember my mom having a strong musical opinion about it. Like we, we kind of owned the stereo. It the blows letter. my mind when people don't 
uh, have a strong feeling about music. Oh yeah. Like I've known a few people in my life, dated a few people in my life where I'm like, cause I obsess about it, yeah. you know? And it's like, Oh, we're having a dinner party. Let me start working on the playlist right now. You know, like it's oh, such a huge part of my <laughs> life. And some people are just like, they have no opinion. Totally. They don't even know what they like. Yeah. I can't, I can't relate it's to crazy. those people. My, my youngest son does this thing to fuck with me that I think is so, it's like, he's, he's like, he's so smart. It's such a good thing to, he knows exactly where to stick the knife. I'll go like, Hey, what have you been listening to? He goes, I don't even, I don't like music. Oh my God. I don't listen to anything. And I'm like, I know you're fucking lying. Yeah, I see yeah, you yeah. with your little earbuds in. Like, right. What are you listening to? Right. Tell him, but he just knows that that's the way to wind me up. So are you judgmental if he tells you what you're listening, what he's listening to? I learned really early to, to not be okay. at least not out loud. Because okay. <laughs> I, when my oldest was pretty young, I remember he came home one day and was like, asked me, hey, can I get that high school musical soundtrack? Ooh. And I and, and my wife was sitting right there and, and I, I look at him, I go, oh, no, buddy. No, 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 no. We, we don't listen to that. Because up until that point, he I thought like I had hit the jackpot. Like he just listened to all my records. He had gone through like a kiss phase. He went through a hives phase. He went through a green day phase. Um, he went through an ACDC phase. He was just like listening to my stuff. And that was the first thing that he asked for. And I poo pooed it. And I could see he was like a little like crestfallen and, and walked out. And my wife was just like, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't tell, mm. don't say that. Like you right. can't. Just let him get what he wants to get. Right, right, right. And I never did that again. I mean, we'll sort of debate music here and there now that they're a little older. and Because, you know, my kids went through that phase of being into whatever was just around the house. And then they all got really into their own stuff. And, you know, kids now, it's just like all hip hop. Yeah. And, um, and, and then it swung back around now where they listen to a pretty broad range of stuff. But, like, we'll get into some kind of debates about stuff, mostly over, like, lyrical content. Sure. For me, which is makes me feel funny because like my dad got mad about of course the shit that we listen to I, I don't get mad about it but i just point out like hey doesn't that kind of conflict with the rest of your worldview a right, little bit right, right, you right, know right, right. um so let me ask you then <laughs> high school musical is it objectively bad or is it just your opinion that you don't like it here's what's funny about that i don't even know what it is <laughs> i just put it because it just didn't sound good i was like a musical it's a big hit movie no not my son. Okay. Not my son. Because I would like to think like my opinions are objectively right. Yeah. You know, because. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, but we all think that, right? Yeah. I, but that's why I want to know from yeah. you who lives it and breathes it. Here's, is there objectiveness? Here's what I way? honestly think. There is no such thing as right or wrong when it comes to music. And okay. I honestly believe Damn that it. to my core. But, you know, there's obviously stuff that appeals to much larger. Of course. Uh, you know, but amounts of people. And, and there's a reason for it. No, but the problem is now that's the worst music. The, <laughs> right, right. Like the Justin Bieber or whatever, maybe High School Musical is a better example. It's like, yeah, you're right. That appeals to everybody. Right. And I'm sitting over here in the corner listening to this obscure thing that I think is far superior going, yeah. well, now the world's just idiots. The world's also the ones watching the Kardashians instead of watching. What yeah, I mean, it's all the same. I mean, you think about, like, I think about it in my lifetime. And again, I mean, I want to stress there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. But... <laughs> I think about it like when I was a kid, you know, when I was in like junior high or whatever, and you'd see Star Search on TV, you'd think that is the lamest fucking thing I've ever seen. Like, what the fuck is that? Who watches that? Who's into that? And fast forward to now and everything is Star Search. You know what I mean? That's the That's whole so fucking true. world is Star yeah, Search. Yeah, yeah. And so they won. That thing won. You know, I don't know. Yeah, but if Is it Bob, good or bad? I don't know. It's bad because if Bob Dylan was on Star Search, he never would have made it to round totally. two. Totally. It'd be like his vocals are terrible, like his, you know, <laughs> totally, like instrumentation, yeah. not great, yeah. like all of it. I think even still, though, every now and again, some weird shit sneaks through the the sensors and some and and catches fire. And yeah, it, yeah. It, every now and again, it's just it's just different, you know. Every that's you could apply that to the whole to every all of pop culture has been star search attire. Agreed. It's all, you know, I mean, it's all pretty fucking limp dick. You know, if you ask me, but like, but hey, whatever. If people are into it, and that's what they want, you know, I don't know. Well, back to your parents um, disagreeing with your musical taste. <laughs> I'll give you my first albums because mm. my parents disagreed. Um, first album I bought was a Doors Greatest Hits album. Great. My mom threw it away Ooh. because I was a young teenager, probably 13 or something. And the final track was The End. And it was pure like suicidal depression right and not that i was acting depressed or goth or the anything father i want to kill you yes all that. Yeah, right, exactly right, right. this yeah, is yeah. the end yeah. my yeah. only friend and 
she like heard me listening to it and was like worried that I would then become depressed, threw it in the trash can. And it was my hard earned money that I had spent on that. So I was really disgruntled about that for a bit. Well, and probably had the exact opposite effect of what she wanted. It probably made you want that record so bad. I still listen to the doors to this day. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? You know, to, to my mom's credit, like my mom and dad got divorced when I was really young. So my dad, um, really didn't weigh in. He didn't, you know, he didn't like the music we listened to necessarily, but he wasn't around to like police it. My mom, to her credit, only in my memory objected to one album that I bought. And it was a, I don't know if you remember a heavy metal band from the eighties called Wasp, but they put out a 12 inch that was for a song called uh, Animal, Fuck Like a Beast. Oof. And, <laughs> and which of course, you know, the 12 year old me was like, fuck yeah. Totally. Um, but the album cover is the singer um, used to wear this cod piece and yeah. it, it, that had like a buzzsaw <laughs> like in it. And so and it stuck out like that. And so it's just sort of like his midsection. So you're really, you're just sort of looking at the cod piece. And my mom mistakenly thought that it was his like dick being sawed off. Oh my God. Even though it was just like his goofy right, heavy right, metal right. stage right. wear. And that was the one time she drew the line. That's like, where the absolute, line was drawn. That's she where the line was drawn. <laughs> <laughs> the name of it, the all of the imagery, she could have drawn the line anyway. You, you know the other funny thing that my mom did uh, around, the, well, it was a little bit later. Um, that, that was like junior high. So this would have been like like midway through high school. I got, I was out, you know, with friends and got drunk at a party and pierced my nose. Mm. You know, somebody just like stuck a piercing through it or whatever. And, um, in nose piercings are just gross anyway. But like, so I came home and I knew, I just sort of knew that my mom was not going to dig that. And so I went into my bedroom and I locked the door and she came to tell me something was like knocking on there. Like, why is your door locked? I to open the door. And then she started getting mad. Open your door now. And I was sitting there and go, Oh no, what am I going to do? And so I opened the door and she took one look at me. And this was like one of the greatest things she ever said. She took one look at me and she goes, I told you no self mutilation. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, she never said that. She never laid that down as a rule. What are you talking about? In her mind, she thought that she had, <laughs> yeah. had communicated. Yeah, that was the other line. No That's wasp, hilarious. no nose ring. Well, That's they go it. hand in hand. She saw the self mutilation on the wasp cover yeah. and yeah. thought that you got the point. Um, I had another album. I don't know if my mom threw it away, but I got reprimanded for it. Mm. Uh, the band Extreme, oh, yeah. More Than Words, was the hit on that album. And that album was called uh, Porno Graffiti, uh, like pornography. Yeah. And so she was pissed at that album. And I'm mm. like, no, but listen to this song. More Than Words is like the sweetest love ballad of all time. Not of all time, but yeah. done, did, had nothing to do with pornography anyways. Um See, that's so, why we hide things from our parents, kids. Exactly. That's why they're going to hide them from us, too. Yeah, now they do it digitally on their phones. Whew. Yeah, I'd hate to do a dive into your teenager's digital history. Uh, I don't even want to know, but uh, my friend caught his friend, his son, this was like a year or two ago, was, was had a secret message account that the app, and probably to anybody under like 30 years old, I'm going to sound like a grandpa right now, because right. like, oh, holy cow. But the app was disguised on this kid's phone as a calculator. Sneaky. And that's how they would communicate. And what was in the messaging? I think just kid stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go get drunk, you know. Right. Nice titties, whatever. You know, just whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, back to musical influences. I did a playlist for my son's drive home from the hospital. Oh, nice. So I was like, this is the first time this kid's ever going to hear music. Maybe it has an effect, maybe it doesn't. Mm. But if it does, I want to be in control of that experience. 100%. Because I know if we get in my wife's car, it's going to be Kiss FM. <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> yeah. leaving that to chance. No, no, no. Way. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, so I did like this whole playlist and uh, it's a solid playlist. So we'll see how that pans out for him in the future. I don't know how I'm even going to track its performance, but. All this stuff changes so quickly, like baby technology and baby trends. But like, I remember when our kids, when, when we when my wife first got pregnant with our oldest, people would wear these, and we did this, would wear these like a strap-on CD player thing that would play classical music into the... Really? Into the, into her belly. Like it had micro headphones on it? Something like that, yeah. Was that still a thing? I don't think so. Because yeah, you can really get on it early. Well, you, the sound definitely trans lates through the belly or makes it through the belly. The kids yeah. can hear yeah, oh, yeah. what's what. So I was cogniz cognizant of that when he was in utero right. and like play music around the house that would be favorable. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 
But how does it actually affect their life in the future? Who knows? You know. I would like to think because I exposed them to so much of the music that I like um, in various ways when they were young, that they'll have a similar thing that I had where I hated my dad's music when I was a kid um, and then came to realize that it was actually really good because he, when I was young, he was listening to like Stevie Wonder and Bob Marley and Dylan and all the stuff that I it didn't appeal to me. I wanted to hear Judas Priest or whatever, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but then I figured out down the road, like, wait a minute, my dad actually had pretty good musical taste. For sure. Yeah. See, I accepted their musical tastes and, uh, listen to it through high school. Like we'd be driving to the beach yeah. and my friends wanted to listen to no use for a name. Cause we saw it in a surf video, you know, yeah. which I still did appreciate, but I was playing Stevie wonder Oh, nice. and they're just like, what the hell is this? And I'm yeah. like, no, you don't understand. He plays every instrument on this track and you know, and they're just yeah. like, who cares? I still listen like Tracy Chapman. Whenever I hear that album, I think of my mom playing it when right. we were kids in yeah, long beach, yeah. you know? And yeah. so I still have all those memories embedded. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see where we go in my notes. We've gone way off course. Um, <laughs> let me see. Let's talk about, are you still recording your podcast? You were unbelievably consistent for such a long period of time. You know what? I, I have put it, I've kind of put it on pause, you know, uh, this year. I just didn't really want to be doing, um, interviews. Like, uh, I just felt weird. Like, you know, after... Taylor died, um, and I had been kind of slacking on it already. But if you, you want to go back a little bit further than that, like during when the pandemic first started and everything went on lockdown, I went, like all of a sudden everybody's publicist was like just looking for stuff for people to do. So, right. And that coupled with Zoom, now you didn't have to be in the same room with people where you could do, all of a sudden I would just did like, I banked so many. I don't know how you do it, but like I usually do them in fits, and bursts, and then I and then I put them out every couple of weeks or whatever. So I wound up getting way behind. I just had a gigantic backlog, and then for me, like I always want it to be fun, and I do it totally independently. So there's not like there's somebody like you have to put this many out. Um, but and I just started to get burnt on. I started to feel like you know we weren't touring, we weren't working, we weren't doing anything, and I was just podcasting. It felt like all the time, and I'm not the super techie so it takes me a minute to edit them i just felt like i was just working on it too much so i kind of had to like take a breath and step back so i kind of go in and out of it but you know especially since um since you know after taylor passed away i just didn't really want to i just did i don't know i just you, didn't feel you like need doing to process it, you know? it yourself before yeah you and i didn't want to have it come up in conversations with people that i was in and i just i don't know i just felt weird about it and i actually have one in the can it's a it's interesting i i you know the, uh like uh, the day, uh, yeah. So I'm, I've had one sitting in the can for a minute because the day that that he actually passed away, we were on tour and I I had recorded the you know I did the interview maybe a couple weeks in advance with this uh, artist Haley Witters, and uh, but I recorded the little preamble bit just like in my hotel room you know and posted it, which was on like a I don't remember what day it was Thursday or Friday or something and. Uh, and, and had scheduled it to come out that Monday. So then when, when everything went down, I just pulled it because I just thought it would be, you know, um, yeah. it just seemed like the right thing to do. And then, uh, and so that, and that was my last episode that was in the can from a kind of a big buildup of them, you know. And uh, and so at some point I got to go in there and, and, you know, update the preamble or something and, and, and put it out. But I just, I don't know, just been enjoying being home and not having any kind of schedule for anything. And then I started working on getting these tunes out, you know, that I recorded with Vance, the, the, uh, the one that I sent you. And that just kind of took up that energy and, you know. Do you think you'll uh, get back into it? <clears throat> I have for a while been wanting to shift gears with it. I actually pitched a different idea a little while ago for a different podcast um, to a company. And um, I don't know if anything's going to come of that. I honestly, like, I enjoy it. I feel like I'm a little, or not a little, I'm a lot burnt out on the sort of particular strain of things that I do. And even if you look at, like, the guests over the last couple of years or so, I've, I've varied it. It used to be way more sort of Americana and country music centered, but I don't know. I feel like, like, 
it, it just, because I'm a one man show, I just get I get bored with listening to my own voice, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and just sort of like I feel like maybe if I just take step away from it for a little while, I'll get refreshed and want to start doing it again, or maybe I'll just do something completely different. I wouldn't mind just finding something totally different. Maybe do it with some other people. Maybe not have to be. Um, solely responsible for it you know what i mean like it'd be it'd be cool to do something like that there's a um, lot of concepts that you could explore it doesn't have to even be an interview show exactly you know what I mean? yeah and but also did, like i feel like it's such a crowded space nowadays and i've never done it i did it briefly through a podcast distributor um years ago, like when i not long after i first started it and i hated it because like my schedule is so hoopty i can't stick to a, a real proper proper schedule because sometimes things just come up and of course you know and it's easy to to if it's just me it's like i don't have a boss so that's kind of the joy of it um did you enjoy it because good god you've interviewed so many icons and yeah. it's like right from your wheelhouse of it seems like people that you have venerated and were passionate yeah. about yeah so i mean how cool is that it's been i mean that side of it has been amazing from yeah. like dwight yoakam and lucinda williams and steve earl and merle haggard and all these people and a lot of people because i went through different phases with it too where when i first started out i didn't i'd never interviewed anybody i didn't know what i was doing i didn't know how to reach people i didn't know anybody's publicists you know i didn't know any of that sort of side of it so i was just kind of getting to whoever i could get to if i if i knew somebody that knew somebody you know and that whole thing and then over time i, I did get to know like a lot of the, the or i have gotten to know a lot of the publicists and, and managers and stuff that work in the sort of americana world um and so started to build relationships with those folks but the way you know i mean you probably go through a similar thing I was, would just take any interview they would give me. So you mm -hmm. wind up interviewing a lot of people that are, you know, putting out their first record or people you're not super familiar with. And I really enjoyed those mm -hmm. because, because you don't go into those interviews with a bunch of baggage. You don't know that much about them. You're really kind of like, it becomes more, almost like more fun and more conversational. Because when you're interviewing somebody who is like one of your heroes, that's got a whole pressure to it. You know? Yeah, totally. You just, you know, oh, I want them to like me, and I don't want to fuck it. I want to offend them. And sometimes people, like, you don't know if somebody who's had a long career wants to talk about different eras. You know, a lot of people, are they don't want to talk about what they did 30 years ago. They want to talk about what they're doing next week. And But the thing you want to know about as a super fan is, like, what amp did you play on that session in 1968, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, so you grew to enjoy the interview process? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And especially, like, Listening back, I was so high strung about it when I first started. I would listen back and just be cringing the whole time. And I wasn't good at it either because I'd talk over people and they'd be answering and I'd interrupt them and, and all that sort of thing. And, and so I feel like the thing that I learned the most, and this kind of got screwed up with Zoom because there's a little bit of latency with Zoom, mm -hmm. which then you start stepping on each other a little bit, you know. But that's like the the hardest thing with interviewing is is just giving the – person space to answer the question you know and like trying to remember in your head that if if i take a beat to ask the next question i can edit that out <laughs> right. i mean that's right, totally right. fine yeah and man everything you're saying is ringing so true to me <laughs> <laughs> i relate to all of it like first of all what i learned is that the podcast medium allows for plenty of beats you don't have to cut out those beats yeah if you're on the radio, they cut that out. If you're interviewing somebody for a magazine, you're going to edit it to make it more concise, you know, mm. but on this medium, if somebody starts going on a tangent, often the tangent is more interesting than the question that you prepared. Right. So you just let them go, yeah. you know, let, them let go. things. Yeah. And, um, which can be tough then. Cause you're like, well, how do I steer it back to where I, so then you got to kind of remember, you yeah. know, and like in my notes, like I said, we're kind of jumping around, but I still got to make sure I come back to that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Often it just comes up organically. Yeah. And so, being able to kind of, that's a lot of it. Um, but uh, you were talking about in your, some of your favorite interviews were the ones with people whose names weren't huge. And I've learned that as well. Yeah. When I first started, I thought, okay, my listenership is into surfing. So they want to hear from these A plus personalities, Mick Fanning, you know? Yeah. So then Red Bull reaches out one time and they're like, hey, Mick Fanning's going to be in town for five hours. Do you want to interview him? And I'm like, hell yeah, I would love to do that. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Mick's been interviewed a million times before. He sits down and he's going to give you the same responses he's given a million times before. He's going to, so it, it was going to take me, it took me 30 minutes of interviewing just to kind of get through that right. shell yeah. to then get to things that I actually want to hear about or talk about. Sure. And, um, 
and that interview ends up being just one of a million out there that he, that people can find on Mick and it's doesn't have real value in my space for what I do. Yeah. But what I realized is my listeners don't necessarily need to hear from Mick Fanning cause they have heard from him before. They just are interested in good story. Totally. They're just interested yeah. in somebody, you know, uh, who can articulate and has a good story. So I would, I'd find surfboard shapers turn out to be super interesting. They're hardworking. They're dedicated craftsmen. You know, they're artists essentially is what they are. Yeah. None of them really make that much money. So they're kind of like always put upon, you know, and like going through something. And so yeah. they develop all this character and interesting. And so I, that I feel like those interviews that you do have like, um, there's all, there's like a, like a almost, I don't know if it's accidental is the right word, but there's like an accidental like class consciousness to them because you're talking to people that are like, it come from a more working class background that generally. hundred percent. Cause you know, surfing, especially nowadays is not exclusively, but is often, I mean, look where we are right now. Right. <laughs> you know, is the, is a, is a pastime of the upper, upper crust, you know? Totally. Um, but like, it seems like a lot of shapers more have uh, sort of a hard scrabble background, especially the older guys. And, the, but then they've worked with all these A plus, you know, pro surfers or whatever. And they're also venerated in their community. So they have almost this celebrity status, but they're, they're blue collar working men, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, women. Yeah. And so it is an interesting kind of dynamic um, and makes for great storytelling, makes for great interviews, all that kind of stuff. I always love, yeah, you've interviewed him at least, what, two or three times, Britt Merrick. Oh, yeah. Brit's I love those interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Brit's the absolute There's something about best. the way that that guy talks. I don't know him. I've never met him. But there's something about, you know, it's obviously his family. It's a legendary Santa Barbara totally family and company and everything. But like, there's something about the way that guy talks. That's like the way he tells stories and the to almost like the tone and timber of his voice. Is very soothing. You know? Yeah, I agree. And yeah. his life experience is also very interesting. Like yeah. he went out of the family business. He was a pastor, founded a bunch of churches, you know, and decided to give that up, come back to the family business. And it's it all very like since, since they took back over, uh, Channel Islands, like they've been on a real roll. Totally. Too. Like, like, I don't know exactly when you would say it started, but like the neck beard, the fish beard, the mid, the free scrubber, mm -hmm. like just one right after another. It's They're crushing right it. Yeah. Absolutely crushing it. So let's talk about the new music. Yeah. Um, how do you, first of all, you're releasing two standalone singles. Yeah. Why that instead of an album? Is there any incentive to make a full album nowadays? Well, it's interesting. Okay, so, I mean, it's kind of a long tale, but uh, when when the lockdown happened, you know, like everybody else, I was just stuck at home, so I was just writing a bunch of music, and it had been just about the time, you know, long enough from when I had made a solo record, which I think I recorded in 2018, but came out in 2019, so I had a bunch of ideas, you know, kind of half-finished ideas, and was just kind of sitting around woodshedding, so I wrote all these songs and, and I had it in mind. I got this idea, like I'm going to not make an album because I just noticed over my last couple of releases, it's just changed so much when you, we always put out a two or three or four standalone tracks leading into an album mm -hmm. release. And those all get a lot of hoo-ha. And then when you put the album out, it just all kind of stops, you know, Funny. like a full length album, I think is almost just like too much for people to comprehend anymore. You know what I mean? They're just not going to listen to the whole thing. Um, I do know. That's yeah. why I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. So it, I just noticed that with my own stuff. I mean, if you're a, a big band and you have a, an audience, then an album absolutely makes sense for okay. me as a guy with really no audience as a solo artist, you know what I mean? It's small. It doesn't really make that much sense. So, um, so anyway, so my idea was I'm not going to make a full length re record. I'm just going to go record two songs. I had like, you know, I don't know, a bunch of songs in the can. I just said, I'll just go record with a bunch of different producers and I'll do two songs with each different producer, you know? Oh, okay. Interesting. And so I started looking into that and I, and I went out to Nashville. Um, this would have been spring of 21. So just a little over a year ago. And I went out and, and had scheduled to, to record with a couple, one being Vance Powell that produced these songs, Long, Long Year, and another one that's coming behind it called Born and Raised. And then I recorded two songs with my friend Jaron, that's the uh, singer guitar player for a band called Cadillac 3. But he's also a great songwriter and a producer and, and, uh, and lives out in Nashville. So 
over the course of like four days, I did that and, um, and got those songs done. And then one thing led to another and me and Jaren just wound up doing a whole record. So I went back out, did another like five songs and went back out, did another three songs or something. Now I've got like a 10 song full length record gotcha. that I've been chipping away at for the last year and have just in between, you know, he's busy with his band. I've been busy with, with, with my band. And in between, we just get together here and there and, and, and go record some songs. So I've got about 10 songs that are finished for that. But I had, so that whole idea of like, I'm just going to go record with a bunch of different producers, it just didn't happen. Um, and once I started trying to schedule that, I realized how hard that that, that was going to actually be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Cause, totally. Because we did reach out to a bunch of different people, and it just, I don't know, it's, it's tough. Because um, most of the folks I want to work with are out in Nashville, and I live in L.A., and it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of bopping around. But um, maybe someday I will do that. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how this goes. But I had these two songs that I had recorded with Vance, and I liked them, and, but they didn't really fit the album that I made. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to put these out it's been a minute since uh since since i put any solo music out yeah um and i wanted to put them out before i put out the full length but even just putting out the full length when that comes which i think i was talking to the label that's going to put that out um and i think we're going to start putting songs out from it uh in the fall okay maybe like mid-november or something like that got it got it. and we're going to do kind of a we're going to kind of meet in the middle i really i didn't want to put out a whole record i just wanted to put out 10 individual songs and just see what that was like. Because that would be like over a year, you know? If you did it every six or eight weeks, you know what I mean? That would, you could do that for a while. Do people do that? Is that a strategy? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, people, I don't know. <laughs> and, it seems and I don't like, know if it makes any sense, but like, well, it does. But because I can never tour, you know, I'm always busy with, with, with Foo Fighters. So I do little solo tours here and there, kind of in the cracks. Yeah. But I can't, I can't put out a full length record and go tour for two years the way like a normal band would do it. Right. So I'm just trying to think of ways to, you know, if you put something out, but anyway, it so makes so much more sense because in the modern world where you want to be like touching your audience every yeah. so often, yeah. you know, post three times a day or whatever the strategy is, it makes more sense to put out a song every month for 10 months. I think we're going to do basically like a hybrid version. Okay. Of that. I think we're going to, you know, it'll probably get bundled into a record okay. sooner than, than that, but maybe we'll put five or six out and then, and then put it out. But anyway, so now so, I got this song that's finally coming out, uh, on the 29th. I don't know when you're posting this, but. July 29th, it'll be out. So what is the business model at this point though? If back in the day was you make an album so that you could sell the album. Yeah. Are you still selling the album today? And if not, then is there any, any incentive to do the full album? Now you make a record to sell tickets, but for my solo stuff, I don't tour it that much. Got so it. it's sort of like there is no business model really for, for what I do. I just like writing songs and, and putting them out. So, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, but it's really, that has completely flipped. Like even for, you know, for Foo Fighters, it's like we, we make, we don't make records to sell tickets. We make records to make records, but you know, but you make money off of touring. Right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Got yeah, it. yeah. Uh, how many downloads or plays do you have to get on Spotify to make it meaningful? Do you have to be in the millions? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Um, I, my streaming numbers are shit, but not after this episode drops. Of course. going to go through the roof. <laughs> Prepare for a deluge. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I haven't, like, I'm self-releasing these two songs, so I'm kind of, the, I am the label for, yeah. these, for these couple of tunes I'm putting out. And it's really interesting. I wanted to do that because um, the label I'm putting out, the full length through, we're like, we can put that out too, you know, True. but I want to put it out myself because I haven't done it in so long. I haven't done it since the days when you printed CDs and, yeah, yeah. you know, called indie distributors and called mom and pop stores and, hey, you got, and, you know, sold them on, on tour and all that stuff. So, and it's so different now. I just wanted to see what that, how it worked and what's effective. And, you know, we're doing, you know, doing some different stuff with like social media ad buys and, and lyric video and all this. I just wanted to kind of dip into it and see what works and what doesn't work, you know? Um, ultimately, I mean, the fact that you get to play big venues with Foo Fighters and stuff, I would think there's a lot of reward and gratitude doing something like this that finds a small audience that you can go play a small venue in Nashville or wherever else yeah. and connect with that small audience. Yeah, it's really different, you know? It's a really different experience. I mean, I love what we do. In of course. Like, yeah. There's nothing better in the world than playing a big show when people are going crazy and, and know every song and are singing along. And that energy is, is you know, you obviously we're very lucky to, to get to do that. It's a very different thing when you're playing in a small room 
to people that don't really know the music you're playing. You know what I mean? And you're trying to win that crowd over and you're, you know, and it's, and it's um, it, way more intimate and, and it's just a s totally different experience, you know? It's like, that, a, and I love them both. Yeah. 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 It's like a comic going back and playing some small venue. Totally. They get heckled off stage because they're they maybe great at playing an arena, but yeah. it's a totally more intimate yeah. physical thing. Um, you ref referenced Americana a couple of times and uh, your affinity for it. How do you define Americana and why does it resonate with you? Well, it's changed so much over the years. Like when I first, I don't remember when I first even heard that genre name, but when I first kind of got exposed to it would have been in the 90s. It was actually when I was in No Use for a Name because the singer for No Use was really into Uncle Tupelo. And that this was right about the time I joined was right about the time they broke up and the first Wilco album, they broke up and became Wilco on one hand and Sunvolt on the other, you know, they kind of split. Um, and it was right when those, those first Uncle Tupelo or Sunvolt and Wilco records came out. And so that stuff and like, you know, Steve Earle was obviously killing it in, in that time and, and Lucinda Williams and, and um, old 97s and Whiskey Town and then eventually Ryan Adams went solo. That whole thing, I don't remember anybody ever calling it Americana. I remember them calling it Alt Country. Uh, See, I didn't, I never heard Alt Country until I saw your Spotify page. Oh, really? And it was listed yeah. as Alt Country. Well, that's what they used to call it. And so it was Alt Country and Alt Country was like, really, if you listen to most of that stuff, it's like guys play, I don't know that a lot of those people even came out of country music. I think they kind of came to it through the side door, like kind of the way I did through rock and roll or through punk rock or whatever. Um, I mean, Steve Earle obviously did, and I'm sure Lucinda too, but like a lot of those, the younger bands in the 90s, I don't think were like like listening to um, country music growing up or whatever, right. you know, or maybe they were, but who knows? It didn't seem like it. It seemed more informed by, it was almost like the way that the Pogues approached traditional Irish folk music, but with that punk rock attitude. Like you mm -hmm. listen to the Pogues, it's not a punk rock band, but it's like that high energy take on this already existing thing. It's like, that's what kind of those all country bands sounded like to me were people that were playing raggedy versions of, of with some country stylings, but it was like just as equally stones. It was equally exile on main street as it was, you know, totally. Buck Owens or something. So, um, and, and that's what appealed to me, but like with, with anything else, you just kind of keep peeling it back and like, you know, going back to their influences. And that's what got me into country music. Okay. And it, for me, I also started with like, when I got into like, country country it was old stuff you know so i went through the you know listening to the you know whatever hank williams and, and the really old stuff through the 60s stuff that's kind of like my favorite period you know for is the it? classic country is like the you know like buck owens prime you know merle when merle Haggard first came out and like whatever that was mid to late 60s I and mean, merle was always good but um and then through all the 70s kind of as it evolved into outlaw and, and all that shit um i just love all that stuff i just love i'm my favorite music that's ever been made, period, of any genre is kind of from the 50s to the 80s. You know, that's just, for me, what hits me the most. But I listen to everything. I mean, I listen to, to you know, modern country and Americana and, and, and all Everything this. other than high school musical. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. But to go back to what is Americana, I think nowadays Americana has become a much broader um, category where I think it's, it's not only older country artists who have kind of aged out of mainstream country okay but are playing what you would recognize as country to like you know the alt country stuff to like just almost any like almost anything that's rootsy i think gets tagged as americana it can be old school r&b it can be you know uh, something that if it came out 30 years ago you'd think was just rock music or mm -hmm. rock and roll and just anything that's like kind of guitar based drums singer keyboardist type of music in is now it seems to get Called Americana, I think. I mean, if you ever go to Americana Fest out in out in Nashville, it's really a broad, broad range of right. of people doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, I was under the misconception that it was um, older music, right? Well, yeah, because that's kind of what I think it how it, what it was. was or, yeah. yeah, you know, like people that had you know, like now Dwight Yoakam gets called right Americana or something. It's like that's country as fuck to my yeah, ear, yeah, but yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. but it, I get it. Well. So I grew up um, with an appreciation for that era that you're talking about, yeah. you know, Merle Haggard and Buck Owens and that sort of thing. So, yeah. and that's what I identified as country. But then by the time I got into high school and shortly after even, 
there was the pop country thing. And so friends of mine who are into that, I didn't identify with at all. And I then, any uh, reference to country, I was repulsed by. I was just like, I'm not into country music, you know? But I was into old country music, just not pop country. Well, now go listen to the 90s country that you're talking about, because compared to country now, that shit sounds like Hank Williams. It's good too now. <laughs> it's, it's when great. I go back, yeah. because now, and I don't want to. I'm not. I don't mean to bag on modern country now, because there's a lot of modern country that I like and listen to. But like, just in terms of production and 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 the like, what made country uh, to me? There's like two things, you know, the, the, like classic country did, you know, was around like certain chord progressions, one four five kind of thing, and, and there was a lot of like sort of well worn melodic and chordal structures to it that is totally. That's gone now, okay. you know, okay. um, and and also instrumentation, you know, a lot of which is also gone in terms of like pedal steel and, you know, mandolin, whatever, you know, all that kind of classic stuff. And then it's lyrical as well. And it's sort of the storytelling side of it that I think is is really like direct in yeah. country music. OK, and that's still there. Yeah. Well, that's why I've come back to it now. Yeah. Like uh, for a long for a decade, I poo pooed country and I was just like repulsed and then. Um, my mom came over the other day and Lauren was playing some country music and she's like, David lets you play country music in the house, you know, like, cause she remembers that I would, I was offended by it right, for, for a yeah. period of time, Yeah, but I've totally come back to it. And like your stuff, I love Sturgill, Sturgill Simpson, oh, like, right, yeah. like all this kind of newer stuff. I'm like, wow, this is. I don't know if I've come around to it or if it went back to an older version that I loved. It's a lot less poppy yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. But well, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, with country people, I feel like country music is one of the most polarizing genres, maybe the most polarizing genre for people. And people, like people will have a very strongly negative reaction to, to when you say you like country music. But I, I find like people that come from like rock and roll land, have a really like, oh, you like fucking country kind of thing. But what they're really responding to is the worst caricature of country music. The totally. most like goofball, um, you know, who, uh, who's the guy, you know, like, oh, I don't, I don't remember the guy's know. name, but like the most like hee haw version of country. And they're not like, it always kind of blows my mind, especially when other musicians do. Like, country is so deep, it's so rich, it's so, so diverse with like different sounds and styles and different. You know, stuff that's, like, just straight pop to stuff that's really, like, heavy, you know? Like, I mean, how you couldn't appreciate a Merle Haggard lyric that's, like, the heaviest heartbreak shit you've ever heard is beyond me. But it's because people don't get past the name, and they have this sort of, like, this this terrible idea in their head of what it is, but it's really just the worst part of it. It's like if everybody judged rock music through Nickelback. Right. You know what I mean? It's totally. like, you know, no offense to Nickelback. Um, um, but you know what I mean? It's, it's really weird. And, I, and, and But it doesn't happen from country the other way. Huh. Like everybody I know in like mainstream country world or out in Nashville listens to everything, loves everything, loves right. what we do, loves, you know, like is a fan of all kinds of stuff and doesn't seem to have that same hang up that a lot of people from the rock side of things are just like, oh, fucking country. It almost putting a genre labeling anything is almost the problem because yeah. it all exists on a spectrum anyways. Like where do you really put the boundaries of Americana or country or rock? It all kind of blends together and sure. then putting the label on it creates this miss or the stereotype, I guess is yeah. what it is. Even so. my wife does that to me. She, oh, don't put on country, but I'm like, but you love Steve Earle. Like, what are you talking about? Right. Why would exactly. You, you know, come exactly. on. Somebody, it, we'll have a dinner party and somebody's like, Oh, I don't eat shellfish. I don't eat fish, you know, or yeah. whatever. And it's like, have you tried every type of fish on the planet? How could you say you don't eat? You right. know what I mean? Or have you tried it prepared this way? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I've heard you tell the, uh, story of getting into the food fight, getting the food fighters gig yeah. and auditioning. You don't have to retell it. But what stood out to me when I listened to you telling it was, I was curious, how bad did you want that gig? Oh, so bad. Okay. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Because I mean, in really, hindsight, now you're really just like, oh, bad. yeah, it was a good gig. And then yeah. I got the gig and I moved on. And I'm like, yeah. no, in that moment, they were huge. Oh, I mean, it was, yeah. It was, well, I, mean, it, I mean, I we, when I was in No Use, we would always beg our booking agent, like, to get us Foo Fighter dates, which we never got. Um, but that was always, because we would always make a list of, like, who were the bands that we would want to go get support. 
slots with, and they were always like top of the list uh, through those years. So no, I was already a huge fan and just wanted it so bad, you know. Like uh, how I, nervous were you for the audition? S- oh, so nervous. Really? Really nervous. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like you did okay in the audition? How, do well, you, feel you can watch it on. I think it's on YouTube. I, Is mean, it really? I think where, I don't know. It's it's. I have the video of it. I don't know if the full video. It was definitely at least a snippet of it was in the Foo Fighter documentary. I mean, it's, I it's, I actually had two auditions about a week apart. Um, so the first one felt like it went well. It was brief. You know, we just played a few songs or whatever. And then the second one was longer. Um, I figured when I made it to the second one, I was like, well, that's got to be a good sign. Totally. You know, I don't know how many other people. Uh, uh, I think, I don't know if they even did second auditions with anybody else. Maybe, maybe a couple people. But, yeah, it was like that great unknown. I would have been fucking heartbroken if I didn't get the gig, believe you me. And plus, I was, like, playing hooky because I was in No Use for a Name at the time. And we were about to put out a record and about to go on tour. So I was, you know, kind of like. Did they know you nope. were around? Okay. No, no. Uh, what'd you do? How did you get the news? And what did you do to celebrate? I I sat around all day the day after the second audition uh, at my friend's house waiting for a phone call. I don't even think I had a cell phone. Or maybe I maybe I had a cell phone, but I feel like they called on my friend's landline or something. I just sat there all day waiting. And, and Dave and Taylor called me and said, you got the gig. Come, you know, we start rehearsals tomorrow. And I was like, woohoo! And we just got drunk. <laughs> I just got <laughs> drunk with my friends. Shams, I can well, honestly say my first Foo Fighter rehearsal, I was hung over no as fuck. I was going to say, same exact thing you would have done if you if they didn't get the game. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just would have been, you know, less celebratory. Right. Um, the band has obviously been at the absolute top for decades, 30 years almost, believe it or not. Uh, it's been going for a while. I mean, I've been in it for 23 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you attribute the popularity and the success to? I mean, like the real deal is there's lots of talented bands out there. I mean, and then some of them break up after seven years or whatever, but what do you attribute the success to? It's tough to really pinpoint any one thing. And it's funny because when I joined, you know, that was at the end of the 90s. I joined in the summer of 99, right? So if you think of like the 90s, the early 90s, like alt rock, grunge explosion, and then there was the punk rock explosion right after that and kind of more like 94 four-ish for a couple of years, you know, where Green Day and The Offspring and all the baby bands all went through the roof. But by the time I joined Foos, this is the late 90s, so you've already got that sort of like bands like Puddle of Mud and Creed and stuff like that, the sort of like um, a little more radio-friendly. I mean, you know, all the grunge stuff, I guess, was ultimately radio-friendly because it was all big. But, you know, you know what I mean? You had that sort of second wave, third wave of alt rock or whatever was already kind of coming around. And so it was different bands, and a lot of the bands had broken up from the earlier period of the nineties and the punk rock stuff was not really in vogue anymore. And, and I remember playing, like we would be like, we'd play festivals and we would, we played a lot of festivals. We always play a lot of festivals, you know, it's just part of the thing. We'd be like in the middle of the bill somewhere playing at like four o'clock, five o'clock sun's still out. And the big bands and most of the, most of the other bands would be like new metal, you know, it'd be like the Limp Biscuit type bands Mm -hmm. of the world, or it'd be like the puddle of mud, Creed kind of bands, you know, a lot of that stuff. And then just like Rando, whatever was just kind of big at the time. And we just were, ne- we, it felt like in those years, in those early years when I first joined the band, that we were just like, I mean, I guess you'd call us alt rock or whatever, you know, but like we didn't fit into any one thing. We weren't part of a trend, you know, we weren't really a grunge band. We certainly weren't like a just straight up punk rock band or anything. Even most of the people in the band sort of loved that thing and we just we were like we didn't have a dj we didn't play the track we didn't sonically fit in exactly but it just we just kept making records and kept touring and every couple of years we'd have a new record and we'd go out and we'd hit it again and you know we'd slowly move up the festival lineup you know and i i don't know i mean it's 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 tough to say i mean i think dave is obviously a super charismatic you know front man great like you know guy to have out front running around entertaining the people and he writes great songs and you know so that's i i would like to think that it's really it's just the songs that drive it all but it's also the work and it's the touring and it's it's the consistency and it's not i think um it's not like you know staying consistent to what your band is you know like not having a radical departure and i like i love 
people that radically changed their band and their music and stuff. But like, you know, the audience else, doesn't always. The audience doesn't always like it, and like I think we've been we've been able to grow and evolve and stay sort of like true to it, you know, over the years, and and we just keep going. Yeah, I all that I see as being totally true. I was wondering if it was specifically the dudes are just good people and earnest and good quality humans because I look at, you mentioned Limp Biscuit. I look at Fred Durst and I'm like, what a douche. Like I, <laughs> and maybe he's not, you know, but it's kind of like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to hang out with that guy for very long. But yeah. if you have good people that all like working together, then those gears that you're talking about can continue turning. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to jinx it, but, I, you know, knock on wood over here, but we've never had some kind of crazy scandal or anything. So, you know, that, that, probably, says something. that probably helps. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly internally, you know, you have to be able to, like, you know, you have to have everybody on the same page in the basic stuff. Like, everybody's got to show up to, on time. <laughs> More or less, everybody's got to make it to lobby call. You got it. Like, I have never once in all the years I've been in the band looked at anybody else on stage and gone, like, fuck, I hope that motherfucker can pull it off tonight. You know what I mean? Like, that's incredible. It's that, that thing, because that's that kills a lot of bands, you know? <sighs> and how would it? How do you avoid stepping in those pitfalls? Because once you're playing the stadium, once you're getting paid huge, once there's women everywhere, it's like, of course you're going to fall in that pitfall, right? <laughs> like, it's unbelievable. You, you know what? I can only speak for myself, but I didn't join Foo Fighters till I was 28, right? And in those early years, we weren't, like, making crazy Lamborghini money or anything. You know what I mean? So I would, I know that for me, if I had had, like, the kind of success that we ultimately got to years down the road when I was 18, it pro I probably wouldn't have handled it very well. But by the time we got into those years, I was already like married, having kids, you know, it's like you, you you're doing other stuff. Like my, my, my life outside of the band has definitely kept me, uh, maybe more grounded than I would have been at age 22 or something. I, that's awesome to hear. Um, but, 28 is still young enough for a lot of people to fall into those pitfalls. Sure. And oh, I fell into them. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I but lived the band, that life for a long time. But know? the band's still together, and you yeah. guys are still executing high-quality work at a prolific rate. And I think everybody likes to work, and especially Dave likes to work. And, and um, you know, it's we've never done that thing like taking five years off or what. You know, there's just – you look at all the all the big bands kind of that era, and they, they – it, it's – the, the X factor and all that that you can't define is why people keep coming back exactly. Because mm. there's a lot of bands that did more or less the same thing that I'm, exp you know, describing, but people stop coming back at a certain point. So I don't know. Yeah. You know that's the X factor. That who the hell knows? You yeah. Know? It's Thankfully, epic. people like us. <laughs> you know, hell, it's great. You it's know? epic, dude. Yeah. Um, where does the name come from? It was like something like a like a cartoon or something. I mean, I wasn't around when Dave named it, so I've, 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 if I remember correctly, it was like a um, like a British, like Royal Air Force term for like they called themselves that because foos were UFOs oh. and they were Foo Fighters. I think got it, something got like it. that. Because yeah. one of those early albums too, there is a aircraft on the front, right? The nose of an airplane or something. There's, I'm thinking. There might be. Oh, no, or the it's a gun. There's a ray gun on It's that a ray gun. That's yeah, what I'm yeah, thinking. Yeah. By the way, I meant to mention this earlier when we were talking about albums versus singles. I miss album artwork. Yeah. Like, you were talking about those early albums that you had that you went and bought records. Oh, yeah. That was such a huge part of the experience for me when I was young was whatever, like um, <clears throat> Elton John's Tumbleweed Connection, right? Like, the whole album is from the perspective of American country music kind of singer. Right. The album has the Old West Saloon on the front of it. You open it up and there's artwork inside that reflects what the songs are about. And you're like entering this portal into this world that exists. Oh, yeah. And that, it was just a bigger experience back then when you had not only the full album that told a whole story arc, but then the album artwork as well was well, so Well, there, there were albums like that for artists that could afford to have that kind of, that kind of, crazy art where Sergeant Pepper or whatever, like that kind of stuff, which was always totally amazing. But I remember always just hoping and dreaming that even with the, the sort of more underground stuff, 
that there'd be a lyric sheet inside. Oh yeah. Or some, you know, something with that, you know, when you would open it up and it'd just be like the white cover on the, yeah. oh, fuck, you know, like when notes. you, when you pulled out the liner notes with photos, cause you know, you didn't, especially if you were listening to anything that was remotely underground, you, you never saw what these people looked like when they moved around or most of the time you didn't see what they looked like. All you had was the album cover. Right. And then if, 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 you know, some band from England actually came to tour the States and came through your hometown, maybe you'd get a chance to see them. Um, but I mean, so many bands that I loved growing up, I never saw them move. I didn't know what they looked like. I didn't know what they dressed like. No, but I mean, you just, salivated. just the album cover. Yeah. And you so just you would just wanted. sit there and just, I would just sit in my room and just stare at album covers and just, you know, you knew every detail. Totally. And then we would, it's funny. Cause I was like, Really, in like junior high, I got really into glam rock, you know, like that was when gr- glam rock was like kind of taking off in LA, you know, like the all those band Guns N' Roses and everybody were like playing clubs and stuff. And so there was there was this band from from uh, from Europe called Hanoi Rocks, and we would look at their albums, and you would just make these like radical like uh, like style. Um, like <laughs> judgments, you know, based on something that like probably one of the guys in the band did one time in right. passing, or you kind of <laughs> got it wrong. And then, but that was the way you had to wear your belt yeah. for the rest of, you know, the high school, you yeah, know, like yeah, that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. stuff. So funny. It highly influenced my fashion choices yeah, and all of time, that stuff. Big time. You know, it's interesting. My niece is really into K-pop. Yeah. And they've done a phenomenal job of, uh, bringing back all that merchandise related stuff. Mm. Like a given album has four different versions, right? They make four different album artwork, uh, liner notes, all that kind of thing. And she salivates over it in the same way. Like the band has these four boys and each boy has a different personality. And then like, she likes that guy, but her friend likes that guy. So then they go buy all that guy's stuff. Yeah. It's like, and they're kiss. influenced by the, which yeah. character is your favorite. You know, it's I like the cat, which it's great. Or it's kind of interesting that they've been able to, bring it back to that actual transactional, like we're going to give you an item and you're going to pay for it. Right. And then you're going to get the yeah, hard so, copy of it. So they're the ones selling records. Apparently. <laughs> no, I mean, they are, there's no question about yeah. it. They're selling a ton. So it's kind That's of interesting. Funny. Yeah. Um, what surf media do you follow at this point in your life? Surf media. Well, I, um, so let's see. I mean, I've, you know, like anybody else, I just follow a bunch of different people on Instagram um, I actually just joined, I don't know if you, this qualifies, but I just realized that John John puts out his edits on his Florence Marine X website and you have to, to uh, be, a member. be a member. And in order to be a member, I just learned this the hard way, you have to actually buy something. So I bought a pair of shorts so that I could then buy the membership. It totally worked. It got me. And the membership, by the way goes towards the cost of the shorts, I think, too. Oh, does it? Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, great. So it's 20 bucks, but the, yeah. it gets deducted from the price of the shorts, nice. so it's basically and now I can, And then I got to watch his Australia edit, because I was super confused, because I saw that pop up on YouTube or something, it was like 30 seconds long. I was like, that can't be the edit. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, that's a trailer. Yeah, savvy, right? Yeah, no, totally, it got me. Well, perfect tie-in, because they're a sponsor of the podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. They, you know what's in- interesting? I looked at their stuff online when that first came out, and none of the designs really blew me away, but I ordered a few things, like last year, just to see, yeah. just out of curiosity, and it's actually really good. Well, it's North Shore tested by the man himself, so yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll, yeah. It'll endure whatever you're going to put it through. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, well, as far as other surf media, I, I subscribe to Surfers Journal. Oh, you do? Okay. And um, and uh, and I subscribe to the Stab website. Perfect. Which I bought to watch that Andy Irons uh, and documentary radicals. series that they put out, and I, and then I just kept it because you know they have some good stuff over there. What did you think of the Andy Irons documentary? I liked it because it didn't feel like it covered any of the same ground as as I mean, not I, obviously some of the same ground, but it it felt like it got into other stuff than the official Andy Irons documentary which i also really liked i thought that was great too um glad to hear that you're subscribed to the surfer journal and supporting print because yeah. i think that's important and d- they do good work and all that sort yeah. of stuff so they need support um but i agree with you stab magazine i pay for the subscription there too and the big kind of tent pole events that they do throughout the year the video stab in the dark and right. the different surfboard things yeah uh, surf 100, that surf contest thing. I think all of that stuff is really well done. Yeah, It's new to surfing. We've not seen it done before. They're doing a phenomenal job at it. And if they can earn their living through private kind of 
through their own audience rather than just selling advertising because the advertising model has a lot of hiccups. It was broken a lot of way, a lot of ways. So if they can kind of get funding from you and I directly, I'm all for it. I would say that their website, if anybody from Stab is listening, and granted, I'm old, we've acknowledged that, and maybe it's just I can't, I'm not good at navigating this stuff. I find it a little hard to find things like they because it was Stab that put out the drive through. Yes, latest one, right? Yeah, that was it. Was I couldn't if it's it was, news, it was difficult to navigate. Yeah, if it's new, you find it real easily. Anything right. that goes past that first page, yeah. it's hard. Say to find. the WSL website is the same way. It's, the it's just too much. It's like a clusterfuck on there. Like I can't find any. It's just like I can't see the forest through the trees. You really can't. Yeah. Uh, do you follow the WSL? Do you watch the events? I do, but I wouldn't say I follow it super close. I tune in when the waves are good. You know. Um, that's a novel concept. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because I sort of I sort of fell off so hard over a few contests this season that when the waves were good in Jeffrey's Bay, I didn't watch any of it. And then I went back and I heard it was good and then I went back and watched a couple heats. Well, cuz it was running in the middle of the night. Well, I guess so, yeah, yeah that too. So problem. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm so I'm a kind of a casual follower. Of, okay. You know, like I I I like if I if the little notification pops up on my phone, and I'm somewhere I can watch it. I'll pop it on. And then if the waves are good, then I'll, then I'll watch it. Okay, but for the record, if there is anybody from the WSL listening, <laughs> if the waves are good, yes. you're more engaged. Well, for me, like my sort of like the, um, the bar for me is if, if those guys are surfing in waves, I'd be comfortable in. I don't care. That's sort of, that's, that's my judgment level with it. You know what I mean? So if there's like, you know, like the pipe contest, the last one, where it was, was phenomenal, and I watched as much of it as I possibly could because it's just fucking crazy, you yeah. know? And I think we all got spoiled, you know, through those years when it was just seemed like it was just kind of always in... It's, probably if we go back and look, maybe we're, we're thinking of it with, like, Rose's tinted glasses, maybe it wasn't as good as, as it seemed to have been, but it really did seem like for a long time there it was just always at, like, the best locations. And, you know, there, I, I feel for them to some extent because, you know, it's like COVID threw everything for a loop, and I'm sure they probably don't want to put it in like a crummy beach break in Australia or whatever, something like that. But they don't not want to, because <laughs> though can, some of those events, some a lot of those venues have been on the schedule pre COVID. They were running in a wave pool pre COVID. Right, right. Right. Um, and so I had, we kind of harp on them a little bit on the podcast, sure. obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I ran into Pat O'Connell a week or two ago who was running the tours he was the commissioner for a couple of years and he left the job to actually be the president of Florence Marine X. Right. That's what he's doing now. But he was kind of asking me to, he was like taking me to task a little bit for things that we've said publicly. Like, Hey, yeah, I get what you're saying, but you need to consider the constraints of the business in these other ways. And I'm like, I fully consider all of those. Yeah. People just want to watch the best surfers surf the best waves full stop. If your business is killing it, it, meaning the WSL's business is killing it, you guys are laughing all the way to the bank, keep doing what you're doing. Turns out it's not. So why not? Right? Here's, so why well, here's not? Here's the question, though. It, it, they've been people, various people, different organizations uh, for years now, decades now, have been trying to break through to that mysterious um, you know, casual sports fan to watch professional surfing. Is there a point in all this? And nothing against professional surfing because I, I like watching it. But is there a point in this where you just go, this just isn't for a mass audience? Yes. Like it's impossible to make, to present this in a way. The thing that I don't understand with the WSL and like, you know, I, I share a lot of your opinions, you know, based on what I've heard you guys talk about um, uh, over the course of listening to your podcast about the sort of the, the wall of positive noise and all that stuff. I, I kind of puts me off. But um, I don't understand why they don't just package a half hour long highlight reel of every contest because you could take even shitty waves and make them look good. Like why don't? It seems like such an obvious thing. Like if you wanna, if you want the casual sports fan to pay attention to the sport, the casual sports fan isn't watching your live stream and doesn't follow John John Florence on Instagram. Yeah. So who cares if it's right. a month old? Right. And then you air the highlight reel that puts it all together and makes it look incredible. Like, why not put your money into that? And there must be an answer because that's such an obvious idea. I think they've done it. Like, they can't have not thought of that, right? You're right. Uh, At times, it's aired on a Sunday, a one-hour version on ABC. Right. Like, not the wide world of sports. They did that back in the day, too. Yeah. But when I was growing up, there was, like, a Sunday version that would pop up occasionally. 
but I don't think it, maybe it didn't get renewed and they tried different versions of it. But I think that you're right. The mass audience will never, the casual fan, they'll never attain that audience and chasing it is futile. So right. what they need to do is recognize that there's maybe a hundred thousand fans in the world, right? That, are, that will watch eight hours of streaming and sell a pay-per-view for 60 bucks to those hundred thousand fans. That should be the model rather than, rather than we're trying to get 20 million and we're going to have advertisers. And so you get to watch for free, but the advertisers will pay us back and blah, blah, blah. And they're constantly chasing that. No, you know who your audience is, package it, sell it to us. The UFC has done that successfully for a very long time. Has that was anybody a small ever pay-per-viewed? Has, has that model ever been tried anywhere with? I don't remember it being tried. Yeah. Oh, Stab Magazine has done it. Oh, right. right Stab right. Magazine's yeah. done it a handful of times and apparently successfully. Really? On a much, much, much smaller yeah. scale. Yeah. So you know what I'm saying? It's like, or keep doing the tour as they're doing it. And then WSL, try this beta version. That is what I'm saying. Get fewer surfers in the best waves in the world and charge us a premium for it. And let's see what happens. But with also that. tonally serve the core more hundred percent because it would be so much more entertaining. Um, if, if it was a little more like reckless, you know, in, surfing in the, is reckless. Yeah. Surfing and, and is surfing subversive. is also a shit talking culture. A hundred percent. As I mean, that's just kind of like, that's just like beach culture. You know, it's hunter gathering culture. Totally, it's making fun of your best friends. Yes, harshly. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't think anybody would get like overly offended by that. You know what I mean? Well, there's well, a way. There's the a way to do it. Would. Yeah. There's a way to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you're absolutely right. Surfing, surfing is subversive, and it's a part of the culture's history. I mean, you had to be counterculture to be a surfer when surfing started, you know? Right. And so that's yeah. a huge part of the history. So to whitewash that or go a different direction, I agree with you, is a misstep. Yeah. So, and by the way, the act itself, if you are putting those guys out at Big Can Dewey or Big Cloud Break or Big Pipe or whatever, it is harrowing. And so that tone that you're talking about needs to be translated. Yeah. So I think we solved it for him. I think so. I mean, it's it's the problem, and I always think about this when I listen to your guys' critique of them, that the I think the real underlying, there's a couple things. Like, nowadays, any public figure is just scared of their own shadow. Everybody. Totally. Because you're just going to, no matter what you say or do, if you, people are so afraid to get, dogpiled on Twitter, understandably, you know, because you will get dogpiled on Twitter if you say, if you just for a second say anything that somebody somewhere finds uh, offensive. Um, which they will. Which yeah. they will. And everybody, all the time, I mean, it's, it's you basically can't, it's just the way that the sort of, you know, the, this moment in time that we're in, yeah. you know. And so I think that that makes everybody super tapioca. Agreed. And... You know, if you have somebody that's, you know, I, I don't know that, what's his name, Dirk Ziff, or what, but if, if you have big money people c controlling sport, big money people are just always, like, risk and scandal averse. Mm -hmm. so it's never going to change. Like, totally. they're, they're never going to, like, just go, oh, yeah, just talk shit on them. On the, just make fun of how shitty these waves are. Like, they're never going to do that. It turns know? out, unless you get funded by your actual audience. Like right. if you sold them the pay-per-views, you're a lot less concerned about everybody else's noise. Right, right. Because the audience wants this thing. We're giving it to them. <laughs> did you hear when, um, well, Snoop did, did, did that with uh, with surfing too, but when, when they had Snoop do the commentary on that Tyson-Roy Jones fight? No, I saw the surfing one, but not the... It was like the, one of the greatest things. Was I mean, it he, really? Because he was just like clearly there was no discussion beforehand of like what was acceptable. <laughs> so you need a surfing version of that. But Snoop is nobody will tell Snoop, Snoop no because Snoop has let you know exactly who he's going to be before he shows up. Right. If if um, Taylor Swift was in the green room at Jimmy Kimmel and she lit up a blunt and started smoking. It would be the biggest news story of all time, and she'd get ousted and canceled and everything. If Snoop showed up and he didn't light up a blunt, right? That would be the news story. Right. You know, like he's just let you but know. You've got characters like that in surfing. Exactly. Like embrace, embrace those. We yeah. always did up until yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, who's surfing? Do you enjoy? Who are you a fan of? I mean, like of the current crop. Um, 
like you just I like watching all the top. I, I love John John Florence's surfing. I love uh, Medina surfing. Um, Jack Robinson. You know, I was just I was, he popped in my head because I just watched that final that I know he didn't win, but I just like the way that guy surfs. Me too. Yeah, as well as you know, of course, like people like uh, Tom Curran and any of the classic. Anybody that's that's really all those top programs. I like the guys that look a little, uh, like just a little wild, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, have you been watching that? Um, that uh, the a good thing that that in my opinion that uh, WSL put out that Kelly Slater lost tapes thing. Yeah, I've been enjoying um, it. Yeah, like you watch him surf like outside of the contest. It's like the greatest thing ever, dude. I said that on air recently. Um, I had that epiphany kind of, I haven't seen Kelly free surf in a decade. When I grew up, it was all of these surf videos with Kelly Slater, you know, all the Taylor Steele stuff. That's what I grew up on. And that's what I loved. And in the last decade, 90% of the time that I see him surfing, it's with a Jersey on. Mm. And in the Jersey, he's always a little bit constricted. He's surfing to a criteria. He's trying to beat Felipe doing what Felipe is doing. I haven't seen Kelly free surf until this lost tape series in a decade. And you, he takes different lines. You know, and it's like, it's, um, ex it's exciting. It reminds me why I love him so much. You know, it was like, he should be always surfing this freely because he's unbelievably talented. It's kind of true. Of all those guys, though, it seems I'm, like, you know, when you dude, see them outside of the, the contest. Makes format. you start to question. The right. I mean, I, I get that they've got, you know, judging criteria and things that, the, yeah. that they have to. So I told you, you know, yeah, it's, it's like there's, you could make a comparison to music. Like you go out and play. We go out and play a show. I'm not going to do like the free jazz version of Learn to Fly every night, but maybe in a rehearsal room when no one's watching, maybe we get a little weird sometimes. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, the, there's probably something to that. And the core audience wants those basement tapes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, final question for everybody is just what was the last surfboard that you rode or what, whose boards are you riding? <sighs> I've got um, actually in my truck right now uh, my Pizel Phantom. Oh, look at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been riding that a lot this week because we got, obviously, a lot of good swell. Yeah. Um, the other one that I've been riding a lot lately is that free scrubber. I love, love that board. I, I'm like, I ding the shit out of my boards. And I got kids, so they ding, the, really, they ding the shit out of my boards. Yeah, yeah. So I got that free scrubber, and it's, that thing is like a magic board. Like, it, I don't know what it is about. It's just, it paddles into everything. It just makes, it makes me feel like I'm surfing beyond my ability. Ability, and I was really, really desperately trying to not ding it. And then I, I, I think I told you I took the kids up to Halama the other day, and when I got back from that, that first, the first surf after that, I pulled it out of the bag, and I just have a huge ding in the in the tail. Like, oh no! Fuck. Probably just from transporting it. I. It's like the width of my the tie down, yeah, in my truck. Yep. And I think that's because I had the boards strapped over all our camping gear, and I think I just wrenched it. Yep. And, so anyway, I got to get that fixed. But I also, you know, the uh, the board that I also love these last couple of years so much so that I've actually got I I re reordered it because it got destroyed. But um, the uh, Fletcher Chenard Wavo Ranchero. Oh, I got as a six four twin fin with like a channel bottom. Hmm. That thing is like the ultimate ring com board. I'm not familiar with that board. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with Fletcher, but I think your buddy uh, Devin Howard yeah. designed it. Before oh, he designed the mid. That makes sense. Yeah, I think it's maybe kind of a similar thing before he did that one. Yeah. Um, yesterday, Devin just had their second baby. Oh, nice. Well, his wife had. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> so he's in it. He's in the thick of it. I yeah. just got the photo this morning. So huge congrats to them. Yeah. Um, side kind of question, final question is, um, has two questions. Has your level of fame given you entree and access to pro iconic surfers who you've always wanted to hang out with and the B question who in the celebrity scene shreds that we should know about. Ooh, good question. Um, well, I don't think I knew any pro surfers before I was in the Foo Fighters. So I guess I would have to honestly answer a hundred percent. Um, I like, I remember years ago now we did a, um, we did a, uh, an acoustic run of shows, um, I think it was 2006 and my buddy rick was managing tim and current at the time so and i we had all gone on a surf trip together down to mexico and then the idea came around for him to come open the shows down in australia and i think he did some of the west coast stuff that we did too so got to know him 
certainly through music. Um, but through that, got to we got to surf a bunch. When especially when we were down in Australia, it was great. Was he still ripping? Oh yeah, yeah. that was he was. I, if I'm not mistaken, he was either still on the tour at that point or oh, just okay. off it. Yeah, okay. this was. I mean, yeah. So 2006. I guess. Gotcha, we, gotcha, gotcha. Timmy still fucking rips. I haven't seen Timmy him never surfing. fucked himself. Timmy was never one of those guys that was like partying all the time. I don't think. No, he um, he uh, got booted off tour because his he had anxiety, like crippling anxiety. Mm. Like leading into a contest, he'd be on a plane like sweating and right. couldn't perform. But he's always been one of the best free surfers. Oh yeah, no, he's st- still amazing. Yeah. Um, and there was uh, oh, what what other? I guess. Yeah, I don't know. You know, surfing and, and music are so kind of hand in hand in in a lot of ways. I like I remember when I first joined Foo Fighters. Like, uh, I think that's right around the time that I'm. Got to know like Paul Gomez when he was at, at Hurley, and like you know the, that was the first time somebody brought me like a big bag of free shit. <laughs> was but was Hurley bringing bringing us? Well, I remember they uh, Paul came to some show we did in Orange County and had like a giant duffel bag for each one of us filled with board shorts and t-shirts and amazing you know, everything. I was like fuck. You remember that stuff? I get used to this. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. What yeah. about uh, as far as rippers in yeah. the uh, in the in the music world or celebrity world? Who rips? Um, John Theodore from uh, Queens of the Stone Age surfs a lot. Um, I know that Anthony and Flea from Chili Peppers surf, but I've never surfed with them, so I cannot speak to their ripping. He was in point, point Break, right? Yeah, I don't think yeah. they showed him catch any waves, yeah. but. I don't surf with any other like musician people. I surf with my surf friends. Yeah. You know? So well, um, bringing up Anthony makes me think of a final, final question. Um, just because of his commitment to health and athleticism, how old are you? And what's your? I mean, surfing aside, doing what you're doing on stage is unbelievably athletic. So have you had to make accommodations to your diet? exercise, cross training, any of that? I mean, my diet's probably the one area that I could really like tighten up. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm kind of <laughs> of the mindset that if I exercise a lot, I can just eat whatever the fuck I want, which probably going to get diminishing returns on that idea. <laughs> the older you I'm get, 51. Sure. Okay. Um, so my, as far as exercise, it just evolves a lot over the years. You know, there was a time that I was really into boxing. Um, I've always run a bit. I always play soccer. You know, I play pickup soccer throughout the week. When you were a kid, um, you were Soccer star, apparently. Well, that's what my Wikipedia page. That's just a weird internet room. I don't know who started that. It's totally so not true. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I was a mediocre, I'm a mediocre middle-aged soccer. Okay. I was a mediocre child soccer player. Okay. And then once I started playing guitar, I really didn't play anymore for a long time. And then and then started, like, just going and playing pickup games when I was a young adult. But I do that. I just started getting into jujitsu in the last six or eight months because my youngest son wanted to start doing it. And he's gotten really into it. So I go with him, although I've fucked myself up a couple times in Did there you? already. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, surfing, swimming, running, soccer, a little bit of weightlifting, you know, just for strength. Um, I should do more yoga. Like, I feel great when I do. I feel great when I'm swimming a lot and doing yoga a lot, and I'm not doing either of those things right now. I feel like it's really hard to maintain any one thing because i'm trying to do a bunch of different stuff all the time that's good though you want to mix it up yeah and then when and it's sort of all really ultimately in in preparation for when there's waves right and like this week there was waves all week you know so like i didn't do shit but surf good yeah um in terms of is there anything you avoid in your diet no okay i mean I, i don't drink I quit drinking a long time ago. Okay. Yeah, and all the things that go along with that. You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't smoke weed, I don't, you know. I've been sober for a long time now. Okay. Yeah. Um, Well, you look fit, and you're still performing at a high level on stage, (laughs) so that's good. You're doing something right. I probably, you know, as far as the on stage thing, I probably play guitar more now than I did when I was even a kid. Do you really? Yeah, I mean, guitar was like a vehicle I loved it and I loved doing it, but I was never studious about it. It was just something that I did with my friends, you know. Um, now I probably spend a little more time sitting around woodshedding and working stuff out. Yeah, good. Yeah, you couldn't. I mean, you couldn't create all that you're creating without that level of passion. Well, I feel but, like it's spe- like songwriting is so fueled by just sitting around noodling. Yeah, you know that when I'm not noodling. I'm not, I'm a lot less creative. Okay. I feel like, you know what I mean? Um, 
if I could in the future, when we'll be able to download information onto our brain and have like a new skill set tomorrow, yeah. uh, uh, playing a musical instrument will be what I download onto my brain. You can I, practically do that now with YouTube. You can find, I mean, I believe you me, I do that all the time. Do you? When I'm like, how do you play that Richie Blackmore guitar solo? You know, then you go find somebody, explain it like exactly. Cut out the sitting there having to move the needle back over and over a thousand times. That content creator would love to know that you are getting a tutorial from him. Oh, I, I actually reached out to a guy that I found some guy's YouTube channel a few months ago. And he was like covering all the guys that I loved growing up. You know, Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes and everybody. And I emailed, I just direct messaged him like, dude, do you ever do like Zoom lessons? I'd love to just like take a couple lessons from you. Did you? We haven't yet, but okay. uh, I think he was like moving or something. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure he was flattered. <laughs> um, so I simply don't have the skill set. I'm sure you're right. Like practice will help me. But um, my dad plays guitar. He's committed his life. Oh, like nice. he's been passionate about it since he was very young. Yeah. And um, so he tried to tr teach me when mm -hmm. I was young. And, you know, I just, it was like hitting my head against a wall. I'm just not inclined in that way. Like, yeah. and I could like practice it and get to a certain level of proficiency, but it just did not come as naturally to me as a million other things in my life have. Sure. And, but I do feel this aching desire to want to express myself through song. <laughs> like there uh, is a part of me that is just like, because I love music so much, you know, and I have yeah. like creative it's in there somewhere, man. Yeah, you I just find it. I yeah. can't do it. You know? And I took yeah. piano in college at a certain point and I was like, that didn't stick. It's really interesting, you know, and I don't know if this applies to you or not, but I, I have definitely encountered over the years, people like, I, I want to believe that just about anybody, if you put your mind to it, can, figure out the mechanics of playing a, a musical instrument or even singing to some degree. Yeah. But I have encountered more than a few people that just like really wanted it and just couldn't do it. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Well, cause I always think if, if you love music and have some basic level of coordination, it's just math. You know what I mean? It's just it's just shapes and some patterns. Pe some people are better at math than others. Yeah, but I or, wasn't great at math. You <laughs> well, know what I mean? Right, but I could right. see the patterns on my guitar. You know, yeah. from a pretty young age, I could see the boxes and the patterns and the yeah. shapes and everything. And but yeah, I don't know. It's a funny thing. It is. Um, maybe one day I could be the vulnerable adult learner <laughs> <laughs> that I am for life. See, here's my let, dad let, let, can we like, can yes. we just address the Val issue sure. because here's my. Totally self-serving theory. Yeah. I am totally agree with the Val idea, the, the vulnerable adult learner, except if you grew up skateboarding and grew up at the beach, it's kind of an out. Because the, the You don't key, have to identify as? Well, or maybe not as much. Because, like, the thing <laughs> with surfing is if what I've seen is when I've tried to teach people to surf that have no ocean knowledge and don't understand the rhythm of the waves... There's much harder. Yes. But if, you know, I grew up body surfing and boogie boarding yeah, yeah, yeah. and skateboarding. I feel right. like I had like one foot in that door that got, that gets you to get me just like one teeny feather level ahead of a vow. We'll drop the V. <laughs> we'll drop the V. You're just an adult learner. There you go. You're an yeah, owl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe you me, I'm vulnerable at times. All right. Well, hey, man, this has been awesome. And no small effort for you to drive all this distance. So oh, yeah. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it, man. It's fun. It's so fun to talk like, I mean, obviously we talked a lot about music, but it's fun to, to be outside the music bubble. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I dug it. Well, thank you. Yeah.